Cicero said there are three kinds of people, the living, the dead, and those that are at sea. Usually when you make a film like that, people ask, well, where did the idea come from? And the idea for this film uh, came uh, right here in Barcelona on the beach. We're having a little party to uh, celebrate the release of the prior film, the, the, uh, the, the, the Sand Wars that you talked about before. And on the horizon line, there was a big ship, one of these ships, and, uh, which was kind of hazy because it was very far. And we started to say, what do they bring? What, what's in there? And so we started instinctively to look at the tag on our, on our clothes. And I had a jacket, and the jacket was made in Bangladesh. And I said, OK, perfect. And everybody had a different you know, piece of garment that was made somewhere else. And we said, OK, is that the whole story, or is there something behind the tag? And that was what triggered this investigation, which was a two years long investigation before starting to shoot. And we discovered with this one jacket that, uh, you know, there was a whole chain of uh, shipping and transport and, uh, and different crafts in different countries. And Bangladesh actually was the, the, the country where the jacket was assembled. So the tag was only one part of the story. And so we did investigate. And we found that the cotton in this jacket was, uh, came from uh, the US, the third uh, biggest producer of cotton in the world after China and India. Uh, the cotton was then sent to China, where it was turned into thread and dyed. Uh, the buttons came from plastics, uh, were made in Vietnam, but they came from plastics collected in, across Europe sent to uh, China to be uh, recycled, to be turned into the little, little balls, etc., etc. I'm not going to tell you about the lining and everything, but uh, it, we came up with the uh, figure of 48,000 kilometers that were traveled to create this jacket, which is more than the uh, circumference of the Earth. And the price of the shipping for this jacket, which, were, which was a really cheap, fast fashion kind of thing, kind of jacket, was cheaper than a, a subway ticket. And okay, and we said, okay, okay, we, we may have a story to tell, <laughs> so let's make a film. And because this equation, that, as somebody said in the trailer, there's something wrong with the equation that something that comes from the other side of the world may be cheaper, is, is often cheaper than something that is locally made. Uh, there's another example that we investigated that's not in the film, which is the anchovies from the, uh, the uh, west coast, the Atlantic coast uh, of Spain. When you go there, there's different kinds of anchovies, and, and the, uh, the most expensive are the ones that are locally made. The other ones, the ones that are cheaper, are sent to China to remove the little spines, and they are sent back to Spain, and they are sold in supermarkets, etc., for, for a price which is like three times less than the other ones. So that was the beginning of the, uh, of, of the investigation. Uh, and, um, and we jumped on a ship. We got access to uh, live on a, one of these container ships uh, for a, a month. And it was a very interesting, of course, uh, experience. These ships are uh, very big. The one you see in the film, the one we've been living on uh, for a month, was 300 meters long. Uh, the biggest ones now, because it's like a race and they always make it bigger because of the economy of scale, uh, the biggest ones now are more than 400 meters long. They can carry 18,000 containers. If you put them together in a line, it's uh, 120 kilometers of metal in one line. 
And of course, these ships are very big and you need to move this big machine across the ocean. One thing that's interesting also is that these ships, when they come out of the shipyard, their average lifetime is about 30 years and the engine is never turned off. It's only turned off when they land in Bangladesh or in India to be uh, cut into little pieces. Uh, so they need cheap fuel, basically. Uh, because as somebody said in the, in the trailer, so they burn an average of 200 tons of fuel every day. Okay? And so this fuel uh, come is what we call, is, it's a residual uh, fuel. We call it bunker fuel. This bunker fuel, basically, if you take a barrel of crude oil and you do all the uh, refining and uh, processing and distillation to get the jet fuel and the gasoline and the diesel, even fertilizer, etc., that's what is left at the bottom of the barrel. It's, uh, it's a 3% of uh, a barrel of crude oil, and it's very thick, it's very heavy, you can actually walk on it. It's very thick. It's like asphalt. And so these ships have to warm it up to be able to, uh, to burn it. And this industry has been burning bunker fuel for many, many decades, but in 2015, academics uh, started to look at the consequences of using this residual fuel uh, in this industry. And they analyzed, of course, the, uh, the emissions and came with the figure of uh, 3,000 ppm, which is particle per million of sulfur oxide. Uh, to give you an idea, in Europe, uh, uh, a car, which is a, you know, which is a, a bad car, <laughs> can only emit 15 ppm particle per million of sulfur. 15 versus 3,000. Okay, and so they did some interesting comparison, and they say, okay, one, you know, one ship equals how many cars? And uh, the result of this investigation uh, was that one ship uh, burn, uh, you know, contaminates, pollutes more than 50 million cars, 5-0, which makes the uh, 20 largest ships in the world uh, pollute more than all the cars in the planet. There's about 1 billion cars in the planet. Okay. Um, and of course, these particles are, are fine particles, and they can, so they don't affect only the people who live in the coastal line, in the coastal regions, but they can, they are moved by the coastal winds, and they can get uh, up to 200 kilometers inland. Uh, these particles, because they are fine and they can fly, so they stay in the air for a while and then they come down, and they, because they are fine, you, when you breathe them, they get to the bottom of your lungs. And of course, that's a problem that's, uh, that's, that causes a lot of asthma. Uh, we have a scene in the film which is in New York, Newark, which is the, the larger, largest port in the US, which brings uh, you know, pro uh, consumer products and, and, uh, and different uh, things to uh, half of the, uh, of the United States. And 40% uh, of the people in this area has uh, asthma. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the studies say that uh, 16 million people die directly for the, from, this, uh, from this sulfur oxide pollution every year in the world. Um, I have my little, my little notes here. <laughs> um, okay. And the problem is that there's not 20 ships in the world, there's uh, 70,000. So that's a lot of, of course, that's a lot of pollution. Uh, of course, that also has an influence on global warming. In the, big, in the very large equation of global warming, warming there's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, industries and uh, human uh, activities that contribute to global warming. This industry in particular uh, has an impact on the greenhouse gases comparable to uh, to a country like Germany or like uh, Japan, okay? And uh, of course, greenhouse gases uh, and global warming create, is very visible, is mostly visible in the, in the poles, right? In the, uh, in the Arctic and the Antarctic, where an average of 12% of ice 
disappears every year. But this is good news. For this industry, uh, it's very good news because the uh, northwest, northwest and northeast passage, which, which is now transitable, which, which you can cross with, during about uh, 30 days to 90 days a year, depending on the temperature and the ice, when the ice opens, uh, they are now looking, and, and that cuts by one third the the, uh, the 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 time and the cost of transport between uh, you know you know between the, the continents. This is becoming uh, a really good bargain because this uh, these two passages in the in the in the North Pole are going to be open soon, 120 uh, days. Uh, a year, which is almost half of the year, and uh, I don't remember the figures, but it, it should be transitable year long, year round, uh, in, a, in maybe in a decade or two. Uh, I'm not going to give you a figure because I don't have it. Um, we can talk about the direct because we are here about talk about the ocean. Uh, so they use the ocean and they contaminate the air, but there's also consequences in the water and underwater. One thing, uh, one thing that these uh, ships use is, is called ballast tanks. So when they are not fully loaded, they, they pump in water in the port, uh, seawater in the port, which they will release maybe you know, on the other side of the planet, in another port, another continent. And in this water, there may be microorganisms, there may be living organisms, like fish, like crabs, like uh, bacteria, like plants. And of course, if these organisms find a habitat in the port where, where this water is uh, unloaded, they can, uh, you know, they can have a good life. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's uh, a, a big problem, of course. That's one of the, uh, that's the main uh, cause of uh, invasive species in the oceans, is, uh, is shipping and this technique. Uh, which costs a lot of uh, a lot of money. In the U.S., they spend 128 billion a year to try to uh, to control that, and it's not easy. Uh, another very interesting thing with this industry, which we all need, by the way, uh, because all everything around us, 90 percent of everything we consume, uh, you know the plastic, the metal, the, uh, the grain, the, the gas, you know, in our car. Uh, the clothes, everything, uh, you know, 90% of everything comes uh, by ship. Uh, there's one thing also with this uh, industry, which is that they have very big engines. And the engines are, uh, are on the hull, are, you know, are, uh, are kind of, you know, bolted on, on the hull. And the hull acts like a drum. And they, uh, because they are so big and they have, uh, you know, such big engines, they uh, emit a lot of noise, they create a lot of noise. And uh, it's noise which is in the, um, in the low frequencies, which is usually what marine uh, mammals use. They communicate to each other with low frequencies. And uh, so acoustic pollution is, is, really, uh, is really a big problem with, these, uh, with this industry. Uh, in the uh, North Atlantic, 90% of the uh, humpback whales has uh, lost uh, their habitat. So they, they have moved away, basically, because, you know, I love figures. I'm throwing a lot of figures, but it's a, it's a 90 minutes film, so I'm trying to make it. Uh, the, uh, it for, um, for a whale, uh, being in close proximity to a, to a ship like this, it's like for us being close to a... It's a it's, it's hundred times the decibels of a jet engine. So it's a lot. It basically wrecks your, 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 your system. Um, there's one thing... Uh, the timing is good, yeah? Uh, there's one thing that I want to talk about, which is the... Um, the flags, the flags of convenience, we call them. So, for instance, uh, a, a French uh, armateur, uh, you know, a ship owner, can go to uh, Liberia or Panama or even Mongolia, which do doesn't even have a coast, and buy a flag. And when you buy the flag, so uh, you buy uh, a package of um, regulations. So if a German owner 
went by the German flag, of course, you would have to pay the wages, you would have to uh, maintain your ships according to the regulations for your country, and you, would have, you couldn't make people work more than uh, an amount of, of hours per day or per week. But if you, if you fly a Liberian flag, you can do basically whatever you want. So people can work 18 hours a day. You don't need to maintain your ship, etc., which uh, has a consequence on the, um, on the ship themselves and, of, of course, the human consequence. I'm not going to talk too much about that because that's a big chapter. But people who live on the ships uh, spend an average of 10 months. They cannot sign a contract for less because they mostly come from the Philippines and they earn more money. And uh, they get really tired. Um, and of course, uh, that, that has a direct cause on the accidents, on the shipwrecks. And there's, uh, there's uh, three shipwrecks on the planet every day. And that's very interesting because we don't see them, of course, because the seas and the high seas uh, are, you know, uh, out of sight. We do talk about that. Uh, we do talk about shipwrecks whenever it's an oil spill and it happens near the coast. So you get the uh, very impacting images of, you know, the, the birds and uh, with the oil, etc. But that that's only a very small percentage of uh, what's happening around the world. So there's three uh, shipwrecks every day, and this. Um, this uh, work force, which, is, which accounts about one and a half million people, um, there's a lot of ac accidents. Actually, the two most dangerous uh, works on the, uh, you know, in the world are um, shipping, being a, you know, uh, being a, a seafarer, or and uh, and uh, and fishing. So, because the sea, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, unpredict unpredictable. Uh, you know, medium. Uh, yeah, so uh, oil spill, also one thing which we, we talk about the, uh, the black tides, that's the, the way we call them, but uh, some ex experts around the world talk now about the uh, white tides, which we better uh, call uh, transparent tides, which is these ships uh, clean their, you know, engines and, uh, you know, uh, all the time and they spill the water. And that's, uh, that's actually uh, more uh, polluting than the oil spills, which is in terms of uh, billions of tons of, uh, of res uh, residues that is thrown into the water, that's a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, billions of tons. Of tons. Uh, Quickly, it's not only it's not all bad news, of course, <laughs> which you know we all always try to have a kind of happy ending in the films. <laughs> but there's there's solutions, and science innovation is uh, is uh, here to help. There's different uh, initiatives uh, that are being developed. This film, I made this film a few years ago. There's some new stuff which I'm going to talk to you about. There's uh, the wind power is becoming big in, uh, in this industry. Basically, big kites that are controlled by computers, and they can save 30% of fuel. And so that when we made the film that was experimental, now there's some ships we are, which are actually flying these kites and which, uh, which pull the, the ship and help reduce the, um, the amount of fuel that is burned, and 200 tons of fuel, or bad fuel every day is a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, fuel. Uh, there's one also a innovation uh, which we talked about a little bit in the film, but we, which is now getting bigger. Uh, the paint, and, and that's innovation, and that's inspired actually by, by the uh, mammals, by the dolphins. And, uh, the paint on the hull. Some paints now uh, reduce the friction, and they can save, I think it's 18% of fuel reducing the friction uh, f you know, between the hull and the water. So that's very, very interesting. And it's, it's, it's something that you don't need to uh, build another ship. You just can paint the ship and, uh, and, you know, and do a little thing uh, to help. One thing that has been triggered by this film, I I'm collaborating with a, with a cruise ship company and, uh, and so to, to make, help them make their, uh, their industry more sustainable. 
And uh, this year, uh, at the beginning of the year, they have released the first uh, hybrid uh, cruise ship, which is a big, a big advance. It's the first one and the only one in the world. Now it's called the Silver Nova. It's a cruise ship. It's not, a, it's not a container ship. People ask me when I made this film in the Q&As, oh, so why don't you talk about, you, you only talk about shipping and you know, the container ships and, the, and tankers, etc. Why don't you talk about the cruise ship industry? Because that's the one we see when we live in Barcelona or in a port area. And basically my answer was that there's 70,000 uh, container ships and, you know, and uh, cargo ships in the world. There's only 93 uh, cruise ships in the world. Now it's more, a little bit more. Uh, but they can inspire uh, the whole industry to uh, do a better job. So this Silver Nova basically runs on LNG, it's uh, liquid natural gas, which is better, but not entirely, <laughs> uh, because, you know, the sourcing and, there's, of course, there's impacts uh, as for electricity, and uh, when they come in territorial waters, they switch to uh, batteries. So basically, when they, when they get in close to our, our coast, it's zero emissions, which is better than nothing. Um, of course, there's the thing we talk about all the time, consumer behavior, uh, which I don't think we should stop uh, being dressed or eating food. But uh, there's one idea that we threw in the film and that... Um, that I think is really interesting. If if uh, if you had when you buy a you know when you buy a jacket or something, if you had a tag, which says not only made in Bangladesh, but okay, assembled maybe maybe assembled in Bangladesh. But this, the cotton comes from here, the plastic comes from there, the zipper comes from there, etc. And you see the impact, and you see the impact that it has. You know, okay, fifty thousand kilometers, which equals to I don't know, uh, a million cars. Um, and the price is maybe a little bit, uh, you know, uh, higher when you get a jacket or anything, any product that has uh, less impact. But maybe that would help us kind of visualize what's behind the tag, what's behind what we eat, what we consume, you know, raw materials or electronics, etc. Et and of course, the. Um, so this idea is in the film, it's there. Uh, nobody has taken it yet. Uh, I, would, I would be happy if uh, some you know, industries or brands uh, would take it to kind of lead the way. Uh, and of course, there is international uh, community regulations, which is the, uh, always the nerve <laughs> of the problem. In this case, it's tricky because um, there's a lot of conflicting uh, interests. So, for example, the, uh, the countries which lead uh, the, 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 uh, the community, the, uh, the, the uh, organization, uh, the World Maritime Organization, which is supposed to make the regulations, uh, its members are all the... Um, the convenience flag countries, so they they are not going to regulate, you know, in a, 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 a do something that's not in their interest. Uh, so that that's where it becomes tricky. And these ships have a lifetime of 30 years, and uh, before they they end up on the on the ship uh, breaking yard, there's uh, not a lot that can be done according to them. And, but we hope that, uh, that uh, something is going to be, <laughs> is going to happen soon. Uh, I don't know if we can do questions or something. Uh, yes, if someone has a question, please. The microphone. Oh, there's two. <laughs> I hand it over afterwards. 
Thank you very much. I'm really curious. I want to really watch the movie or the, the film. It's, uh, I, I knew of its existence, but I didn't see it yet. Um, just a technical question. You were mentioning right now at the end like a possible solution for, you know, that we as a consumer know what we are buying. I think in the food industry that is already existing. I know that a, a friend of mine, he suddenly, by collaborating with me some years ago, he became really... Um, very intense with going with his phone to the supermarket and QR code or reading the QR code of each product. So it took him one hour to do shopping and his wife was really getting nuts. She said, where are you? Oh, I'm, I'm, I have to check what we are buying. So maybe something like this, um, I hope that they are working on that already um, in yeah. the, uh, I don't know, in the textile industry, in the, in the big shops. Yeah, maybe yeah. something like uh, H&M and Zara and all those big companies should be pushed a little bit to, to create something like that. And Absolutely. maybe you are a very good spokesperson who could just <laughs> send them an email. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There's one thing that checks in the film, you know, you cannot tell, you know, I want to tell you the story of the film and all the... Everything, but there's one thing which is uh, it's called the uh, something registry. So you can now, if you are, because we are talking as individuals, we you know we have we are on a big on a small scale, but importers and exporters, because they rent the ships. Actually, it's like you know you rent a car or you know to to take your stuff from one place to another. Now, when you are an exporter from I don't know China and you want to uh, send a container to uh, Spain, you can now get on this registry and the, uh, the, uh, the ship owner uh, you know, is obliged to have its information on this registry. So if you see, okay, I'm gonna send a container, you can look at the name of the ship and they have like a license plate, like, like the cars, no. and you can see all the impacts that it has. Oh. And the prices don't really vary for, for the exporter. So you can go on the, on a, on a better ship for the same price and, uh, and kind of use this kind of natural selection of giving less job to the, more, the, the most polluting or the less well-maintained ships. So there's, there's, uh, there's opportunities. <laughs> hi, hi. Hello, hello. Okay, everybody can hear me. Um, so my question is uh, regarding the... Uh, um, you were okay. You were um, part of the uh, uh, documentaries were shot on the uh, uh, tanker on a ship on, on a, the on ship. Container yeah. ship yeah. I grew up on the merchant navy vessel. Really? <laughs> and uh, what I find very interesting, I have heard about your documentary, but I haven't seen it yet. Did you actually interview and put um, um, a bit of the focus on sailors and their point of view on, on the oceans? Because I feel that narrative is missing all the time from any kind of discussions about oceans. What actually sailors, yeah. do, you know, people, uh, people that, who are in the center of it. That's a big part of the film, uh, you know, because we want, you know, uh, you know, in any storytelling, empathy uh, is very important because you can throw data as I just did with you. Uh, but, you know, it's going to hit here, it's not going to hit here. So but we spent a lot of time, of course, that's why we wanted to be on the ship. With these guys, we actually went to the Philippines and to their families. And, uh, and it's very interesting because Filipinos, mostly because they are, they are a coastal country and they speak English, so it's, it's, it's the main workforce uh, in this, uh, you know, in the shipping industry. They fall in some traps also. Uh, when you come from another a European country, let's say, you know, one of the Northern Europe countries, some of the officials in the ships, you know, the one, it, it's actually layered like society. The guys who are on top, uh, you know, are white and they come from European countries and the, their wage is much higher. And as you go down, they live right, you know, they don't see the, they don't see the light of the day. And they have to sign 10 months. And actually, we went to Manila, where they are hired, and there's headhunters, and they go with signs, and say, okay, I need 10 guys. And people need work, need work. and so they go, and they sign, and they get more money, of course, than staying in Manila and, and, and doing a, another job. Uh, and they come back after 10 months, with uh, a bunch of, you know, uh, of money in their pocket. And they, you know, the idea at the beginning getting on the ship was to, okay, I'm gonna do that one year or two. I'm gonna buy 
a little grocery store or something for the family and me and, and stay home and see my kids grow up and everything, but they fall in the trap of, they are so happy to come back and they buy a car and they get a credit and they buy a house for the, for the family. And so they get indebted and they, you know, most of the guys we've met, uh, you know, they are going to be at sea forever, for a long time. And it's very dramatic, there's a lot of dramatic stories of, uh, of kids, uh, you know, when you say daddy, daddy is the picture, it's not a real person. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. All right, uh, that's, that's, thank you, thank you very much. Oh, one thing, one thing. Oh, there's one, there's one quick question over there. Yes. Um, uh, according to the, the fashion industry, hello. <laughs> um, actually, my sister is running a venture here based in Barcelona, which is called Bicom uh, Tran uh, Studio. And they are actually doing a blockchain about the old fashion industry. Mm. Uh, some companies like Equalf or Hof, the trains that I have here, they, all, they are already using that QR that you can find it uh, in They're Very interesting. I will be very happy if you want to get in contact with Yeah, me. very good. One thing I'm going to uh, wrap with that. I'm going to give a link to you, Tatiana, with a password, because the film is still in, in distribution, so I cannot give it for free or put it on YouTube or whatever. But I'm going to give you a link with a password. And since uh, you have all the emails and the contacts, uh, you can see the film yeah. uh, on your computer. Or... Thank you. Thank you.